just for the nice introduction. Can everyone hear me? Yes? Okay, great. Well, my topic today concerns publication. If you look at uh, Jeff's call for this session, which is in the program, you'll see that that was the last item, the last topic that he listed that would be appropriate. So I guess it's appropriate that I'm speaking uh, last uh, here this morning. Um, because my topic concerns a new uh, publication called Studies in Digital Heritage that my co-editor-in-chief and I, Gabriele Guidi, hope will be of interest and some use to this community. Uh, let me begin with some background. Why uh, did we start the journal? Uh, first, let me say that um, we didn't know that Philip Verhagen at yesterday's AGM would be announcing that CAA is starting a journal for our community, which we applaud and is wonderful. We actually started this two years ago as part of a general trend uh, of editors of scientific journals uh, under the imprint of major commercial publishers to resign in protest. Gabriele and I had founded another journal published by Elsevier, which still exists and which we wish well, I have to say, nothing against it, called Digital Applications in Archaeology and Cultural Heritage, which some of you may even have published in. We had an ongoing uh, disagreement with the journal uh, from the moment it began about two things, which finally, after several years of um, operation, we decided we're never going to be resolved, at least the way we wanted them to be resolved. Uh, and, and so we resigned and started our own journal, the journal I will talk to you about today. And these two issues were very important. Uh, one is uh, the inability of that journal to embed on the web page as a kind of interactive, dynamic illustration the very 3D model that the journal was set up to allow scholars to discuss. So DAACH, in its mission statement, was specifically founded to provide an outlet for publishing 3D models, the kind presented here today, and many, many others. There wasn't such an outlet uh, before, and um, the only way to publish a 3D model in a traditional scientific publication, at, traditionally in print, but increasingly in digital format was to give us a screenshot or a rendering, a still rendering. And for years, uh, those of us doing this, going back to the 1990s, felt that this was very inadequate and unacceptable. So when the new standard of WebGL started to be developed by the Kronos Consortium in the mid-2000s, we could see that it would soon be possible to, um, in, as soon as HTML5 came along, which it did by 2010, to actually now uh, reached the final climax of the evolution of the support of multimedia on HTML, started by Tim Berners-Lee, who in 1990 published the famous first web page. It only had text. In 1991, he added the support for images, but you couldn't have images and text on the same page then. In 1992, you could. By the late 90s, you could have audio and video, but you still couldn't have the interactive 3D model on the web page. In, embedded in the HTML. You could have it on the side, you could have uh, plugins, you could have um, standalone programs that you could download. Okay, those were all nice workarounds, but they weren't really what we wanted, which was to have the 3D model right there on the web page. So we started this journal, and of course the key was to uh, implement some, some such solution, especially a WebGL solution. At the time, there were a number of different web services with the ambition to be for the 3D model what YouTube was for the video. And the one that has emerged um, as the de facto standard, I think it's fair to say, is one that we embraced uh, right from the start and we have a very close working relationship with, and that's Sketchfab. Uh, Elsevier would not uh, the publisher of digital applications in archaeology and cultural heritage, would not uh, allow our authors to embed their Sketchfab models on the web page of the journal uh, or any other such uh, third party um, web service embed code. 
So that was one dispute that we finally, after tearing all of our hair out, um, I guess there's a little bit left, but uh, we, we, we throw up our hands in despair. And the other one, we share with a whole range of editors. If you Google editors resigning in protest from Springer or Elsevier Journal, something like that, you will see a whole, in the last five or six years, a whole bunch of editors in disciplines ranging from math to uh, linguistics, uh, Germany, Finland, the United States, have resigned from these commercial journals because of the article preparation charge. And um, the article preparation charge of our journal at Elsevier was $3,000. Uh, in the uh, opening manifesto launching our new journals, uh, Studies in Digital Heritage, uh, we, uh, I hope wittily, uh, called that fake article, <laughs> fake open access. $3,000 is, is a is an absurd amount of money for most people in this room, I think, an impossible amount of money to pay to make your article open access. So, okay, Elsevier can say, our journal is, supports open access, but only for those who cough up $3,000. So, we shopped around to look for um, an existing consortium of open access journals that could take on uh, studies in what we can call studies in digital heritage. And we were happy to find that my university, as part, as part of an initiative of the so-called Big Ten universities in the United States, which are basically the big state universities in the Middle West, like Ohio State and University of Michigan, Michigan State, University of Illinois, and so on. Those universities, five or six years ago, at, a, at the highest level of their presidents, who are constantly meeting and have their own organization, decided to take on Springer and Elsevier and say, it's outrageous that we pay the salaries of our faculty, we pay for the research labs, we raise the money, help the faculty raise the money for their sponsored research, and then when they finally have results that they want to publish, they have to submit them to these commercially supported journals, which then turn around and not only demand a huge amount of money for open access, but uh, have, in many cases, very expensive subscription fees. So instead, what we should do is just start our own journals through our libraries. So the, it turned out that the Indiana University Library, I was happy to find, acted on this and has now supports over 30 different scientific journals um, with faculty members at our university, Indiana University, as editors, and of course also uh, editors from other universities. So we were able to come in under the aegis of the Indiana University Library and start this new journal in 2016. And uh, as you can see on my title slide, we've already published uh, last year our first uh, two issues. So that, that's the, the background to why I'm standing here today. So let me tell you a little bit about the journal. Uh, it's uh, it's uh, published using the journal management uh, software known as, it's very dark up here, the uh, Open Journal Systems, which a lot of uh, op uh, open access journals use around the world. Um, we offer professionals active across all of the subfields of digital heritage the opportunity to publish their work um, online with obviously with peer review, traditional peer review, no cost uh, open access and no cost to readers, subscribers, including institutions, no cost to authors. We have no article preparation charge. Um, and we uh, think we will be publishing three issues a year. Last year we had two issues, but our second issue had 45, 46 articles, so it was a mega issue. Um, I think generally we'll be, we'll be publishing three issues uh, a year and about probably uh, 25 to 50 articles per year is what it, what it looks like. We have many articles, as you will hear in a moment, already in the pipeline. Topics appropriate for the journal cover the entire workflow of cultural heritage studies from discovery and documentation of monuments to analysis, interpretation, and not, not last but not least, especially in this session, public outreach and education. Articles should highlight the role of digital technology in facilitating cultural heritage research and applications. SDH, as we call it for short, 
is especially eager to publish work that is innovative and creative in one of two ways. Articles whose importance depends on the value of the cultural object studied and those presenting innovations in the digital technology we use to study cultural heritage monuments. For an example, for example, an article presenting a new insight or discovery about a key monument, such as, say, the Temple of Zeus at Olympia, which I think everybody in this room would agree is a major monument in and of itself, so that many, there's a great interest in following uh, the development of scholarship on it. That would be appropriate for the journal, even if there was no innovation on the technical side. On the other hand, if you have a, you know, an innovative new technique for 3D data collection, gathering, reuse of virtual reality, augmented reality, uh, on the hardware side or software, that would also be uh, appropriate, even if your test case was some obscure you know, local monument where you happen to live that is not of general universal interest like the Temple of Zeus at Olympia. So I hope that's clear. So either innovative because it brings a new insight about a major monument or innovative in the use of hardware and software and or software. In addition to articles, the journal also publishes mediated blogs, reviews of books, software and hardware, which I think is completely lacking in our field and we'd all love to know, like what scanner should I buy, what, what, what reviews, where can I even go to re read a review of a scanner or a piece of, of uh, photogrammetric software? Uh, what is the state of the art uh, in uh, these uh, areas of hardware and software that we all use? And uh, the content of blogs can vary widely, including, for example, a comment, whether critical or constructive, about an article that we've published. And I think that's also something needed to enliven the field and, and allow progress. We are in digital age, things are supposed to be interactive. Um, authors generally publish their work and then maybe a year or two later get some response, uh, usually very little. Um, we would like to, um, to you make our journal very lively place where an article, once it's put out there, that's just the first step in the discussion and the, and the debate. And other people are invited to chime in, are able to do so through the mediated blog. Of course, uh, the mediated blog is mediated, so it will be peer reviewed and, uh, and we will try to maintain the same level of quality control that we apply to the article in the first place that we published. Um, you can also use the Mediated blog to post your calls for uh, papers at conferences or your calls for participation in conferences and so on. So we want it to be a resource uh, for the community to use in every way you can possibly imagine and uh, there are probably some ways you can imagine that I didn't just list. Now articles can be quite lengthy. One thing I never understood at uh, the Elsevier Journal was why is there a 3,000 word limit for a digital publication? I mean we're not cutting down trees and we're not uh, taking up uh, printer's ink, so what difference does it make whether your article is uh, 3,000 words or 10,000 words? Uh, so we've just set our limits, since that seems to be uh, something you're supposed to do, at 10,000 words, which is quite long, but we also say it could be longer by a special agreement. So if you, you know, have a 50,000 word article, uh, it's almost a monograph at that point, <laughs> that you want to publish, just drop us a line. We, we may well uh, agree to uh, that your topic work is worthy of that kind of extended treatment. So, and in addition to text and images, SDA supports the following embedded media, audio, video, and interactive 3D models using a WebGL solution such as 3D Hop, Sketchfab, or Unity. Uh, and, whoops, on this slide, which I was supposed to have already been showing you, you can see an example of an embedded, embedded Unity web player. And notice that it's actually uh, right there on a, on a page. You only have a, a line or two of text above and below, but it is a kind of an interactive figure or illustration to the argument being made on the page in the article. So we finally have realized that vision that we had when we started DAACH, and which DAACH, alas, still, I don't, as far as I can tell, uh, has not realized. Once an article uh, has been submitted, it is assigned to an editor who in turn recruits a minimum of two or ideally three referees. Identifying suitable readers can sometimes take a month or more. Referees are generally given four weeks to write their reports. 
Our goal then is to act on submissions within three or four months of, um, the, after we receive them. As with most journals, submissions can be accepted, subject to revision, uh, or so they can be accepted as is, uh, accepted subject to revision or rejected. If an article is accepted subject to revision, the original referee requesting changes is consulted before the new version is accepted and published. So long and short of all that is we're very concerned to maintain quality control. We realize that quality control is the key to um, having a good reputation. Having a good reputation is the key to attracting good articles and ultimately having a good impact factor, all of which creates a virtuous uh, circle and um, makes the journal more and more useful. We encourage authors to team up to propose special issues for the consideration of our editorial board. We also encourage authors to volunteer to serve as reviewers and members of the editorial board. And it's very easy to do these things. If you go to the journal, uh, I'll get, give you the URL in a moment, you can sign up and you will get notices when new articles appear. Uh, and you'll be considered a subscriber. You don't need to be a subscriber since it is open access to read the journal, but if you are a subscriber, then you're part of the community and we can call on you and you can feel part of, of what we're doing. I mentioned the editorial board. Here you can see the, the list of the current membership. You'll probably recognize at least some of the names because a lot of these people are very active at CAA. Some of them are here at, at this CAA in Tübingen. Um, and if you want to be a member and want to help us out, think you have something to offer in areas of expertise, please contact me or Gabriele and we would be happy to uh, add you. So thus far we've published one special issue. Uh, the more than 40 papers that passed peer review from the annual meeting of Cultural Heritage and New Technology held every year in Vienna. And the one that we published here was the uh, edition of 2016. Three other special issues are in the pipeline. Uh, one on perceiving cultural heritage through digital technologies. Another on the use of 3D technologies applied to uh, sound, acoustics, and uh, Una and Erica may be interested in that for their NYX uh, thesis. Uh, that's the call for the, those um, papers is just going to go out now from Jerry Katz. Happy to con put you in touch with him, um, but I, I'm sure he'd love to have a, an article from you about that. And then there's another um, on a selection of papers from the upcoming meeting of Society for American Archaeology to be held in Washington. Um, what month are we in March? Next month on 3D technologies applied uh, across. Uh, Mesoamerican archaeology. And that will be edited by Laura Harrison. And I've talked to some other people here at, at S, uh, CAA about doing special issues. Uh, I we haven't reached quite the point of formalizing uh, their, the ideas that we bandied about, but there may be one or two other special issues. As you can see, if we go back to this slide, when we publish a special issue, we can still publish the individual articles in the same issue. So there can be, in the same issue of S SDA, so there can be a special part and then a normal, regular article part. So um, keep sending in your individual articles too. We're not just for special issues, but we like special issues. So we, um, the articles are published in two formats, online, in HTML and uh, in, in, in PDF format. PDF can be read online, but you can also download uh, the PDF. And uh, the issues themselves uh, are available to be printed by the print on demand service of the Indiana University Press. If anybody wants to have a hard copy, if you need that for tenure and promotion case that you're involved in, you can, we, can, we can print it for you. As you can see on this slide, all the articles are assigned a, a, a DOI, and we also support ORCID, or the Open Researcher and Contributor ID. 
As a, public, as a publication of the Indiana University Library, SDH offers authors free professional services, including basic copy editing and help with layout and design. The library also handles advertising, publicity, and submission um, of our application for uh, an impact factor with the various agencies that give you an impact factor. As far as impact factor is concerned, We've started the process of being indexed on Scopus. We expect that to proceed quickly now, since we have two issues out. Uh, this is the largest abstract and citation database of peer-reviewed literature, including scientific uh, journals, books, and conference proceedings. Once listed in Scopus, the number of citations of SDH articles from other Scopus journals will be automatically calculated, providing the impact factor for the journal and for the authors uh, Information will be provided about citations, average citations per article, and the H-index. I know that's important for many of you, especially uh, young people starting out their careers. SDH is also about to be submitted to the Directory of Open Access Journals, DOHJ, a website that lists open access journals that meet high quality standards by exercising peer review or editorial quality control and which use a funding model that does not charge readers or their institutions for access. And I think we conform to those uh, requirements. So we expect to be listed in, uh, in this important directory. Finally, SDH is interacting with some national bodies for obtaining recognition in various national academic systems. In Italy, for example, SDH is already included in the relevant Cineca list and it is shortly going to be added to the corresponding ANVER list. And if any of you come from countries that have other important lists that you need to, your publications to, you, know, you need to publish in journals on those national lists, let us know and we'll do the, 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 the the paperwork needed to uh, affect that. In short, SDH is here to serve the needs of the international community of digital heritage professionals and to do so by providing peer review, open access, generous page limits for articles, no article pro processing charge, and no sacrifice in standards with respect to style, layout, and scientific substance. In our first year, we've already published over 45 articles. Uh, we've got, as you see from the special issues that I, I, I mentioned and some other individual articles. We have many more, perhaps 25, 30 already in the pipeline for this year. We're here to serve your publication needs and look forward to receiving your submissions and suggestions for special issues. Our URL is very easy to remember, studiesdh.org. Thank you for your attention and I'll use my remaining time to uh, answer your questions.